So what exactly is a free radical? Well, it's this chemical species with an unpaired electron in its outer orbit. One example, and probably actually the most well-known example, is oxygen. Normally, oxygen's got the four pairs of electrons here, but in a free radical situation, it might gain an extra electron. So now you've got this one unpaired electron, and we call this guy a free radical. And it's what causes all the trouble and potentially can cause cellular injury. Now, free radicals are generated both normally in physiologic conditions and abnormally in pathological conditions. Physiologically, so we're talking like normal conditions, it can happen during oxidative phosphorylation, which we know is this super important process in our cells to help make ATP. During this process, you've got this molecule called cytochrome C oxidase, or sometimes it's just known as complex 4. This molecule transfers electrons to oxygen, and oxygen gladly accepts those electrons. And this in turn causes the mitochondrial matrix to pump protons out. And this creates our proton gradient and drives the production of ATP. Great. So normally, for oxygen to be happy, it accepts four electrons and becomes water. But what if it doesn't receive all four? Well, that, my friends, is when we get free radicals. Okay, so if oxygen grabs just one electron, it becomes superoxide, so O2 with a little dot for its extra electron. If it gets two electrons, it becomes hydrogen peroxide, and then three electrons, it's the hydroxyl radical. Then finally, if you get all four, you get water. So one, two, or three electrons is called a partial reduction of oxygen, so oxygen isn't being reduced all the way to water. Because remember, that reduction is a gain of electrons, so in this case, it's only partial. And remember that this happens physiologically, like in normal conditions. Also, though, you can generate free radicals in pathological conditions. So not in normal conditions, right? One way is through ionizing radiation, and this usually generates a hydroxyl radical. And this will happen when the radiation sort of comes in and hits water in your tissue. So it hits the H2O, right? And it knocks off an electron. So if you go backwards here from water, you'll end up at the hydroxyl radical, right? And these hydroxyl free radicals are generally the most reactive, and so therefore probably the most damaging to your cells. Besides ionizing radiation, though, inflammation is another way that you can get free radical generation. When you get an infection and neutrophils come by to fight that infection, there are two mechanisms they use to kill whatever microbe there is, one of which is oxygen-dependent. Oxygen-dependent means you need oxygen, so we can probably guess that oxygen's involved. Usually this starts with what's called an oxidative burst, where an enzyme called NADPH oxidase takes your oxygen and converts it to superoxide. And then it goes on to eventually be converted into bleach, or HOCl. But mainly our culprit for producing free radicals is going to be this first step, where NADPH converts oxygen to superoxide. And a third way that we can produce free radicals is through contact with metals. And we're usually talking about metals in the context of the body, so like copper or iron, where they're usually bound to something. One example are something called transferins. These proteins bind iron and sort of help you control the amount of iron in your blood. Why do we want to make sure it's controlled? Well, it's because if it's not bound, if it's not controlled, it can generate free radicals. A reaction called the Fenton reaction allows iron to generate a free radical, usually the hydroxyl free radical, our most dangerous one. So let's think about it in the context of some disease, like hemochromatosis, where iron builds up and you get serious tissue damage, like cirrhosis in the liver. The primary mechanism behind this is a buildup of free radicals. Similarly, in Wilson's disease, there's this excess of free copper, so copper that's not bound. In the same way, you end up getting this tissue damage from free radicals. Okay, finally, there are drugs and chemicals that can also produce free radicals. For example, a drug like acetaminophen, which, like many other drugs, goes to the liver to be metabolized. In the liver, the P450 system takes care of it, which is like this group of really important drug metabolizing enzymes. This metabolizing, though, can generate free radicals, and so when high doses of acetaminophen are taken, it can cause massive death of tissue in the liver, and this is mainly from free radical damage. Okay, so all this talk about free radicals causing damage, 
But how do they actually damage the cell? Well, one big way is called lipid peroxidation, meaning that they can sort of steal an electron from the lipids of cell membranes. Remember that they have this unpaired electron, so they want another electron to be its pair. So what can happen is it can take an electron from a lipid in the cell membrane, which leaves that lipid with an unpaired electron itself. And then that lipid, now that it has an unpaired electron, can do the same thing to another lipid, and it can propagate this process in sort of a chain reaction. And as you can imagine, this can hurt the cell membrane and damage the cell as a whole. Free radicals can also oxidize both proteins and DNA inside the cell as well. Oxidation of proteins can obviously hurt the cell, depending on the protein's function, but oxidation of DNA is serious and is a super big player in oncogenesis, or causing cancers, since cancers are formed by mutations of DNA. So if these free radicals oxidize DNA and introduce mutations, all of a sudden your risk for developing a cancer goes up. Okay, so since this can happen in both pathologic and physiologic settings, and since our bodies are so smart, it's totally reasonable that we have ways of getting rid of them, right? Yeah, it is. The first defense against these oxidants are antioxidants. That makes sense, right? Because oxidants, like free radicals, can take electrons. So antioxidants, like vitamin A and vitamin C and vitamin E, can all eliminate free radicals by donating electrons. Another way we can get rid of them, which we sort of touched on already, are metal carrier proteins, like transferins and ceruloplasmin, which respectively bind or carry iron and copper in the blood. For example, transferrin carries it and delivers it to the liver and macrophages, where it can be bound by a molecule called ferritin, and then it's sort of hidden away so it can't generate any free radicals. And finally, another way we can get rid of free radicals is by enzymes. And there are three super important players in the enzyme free radical game. So remember that in between oxygen and water, you've got superoxide with one electron, and then hydrogen peroxide with two, and finally hydroxyl with three, and then water with four, right? Okay. Now, our three enzymes are each going to have the job of focusing on one of these free radicals. Superoxide is taken care of by superoxide dismutase. That one's pretty easy. An enzyme called catalase takes hydrogen peroxide, and then hydroxyl free radical is taken by glutathione peroxidase, which is less intuitive, because maybe you think that that one should be for hydrogen peroxide, but it's not. So remember that glutathione peroxidase is for a hydroxyl free radical. All right, so knowing what we know about free radicals, let's go over a clinical example about a chemical called carbon tetrachloride. That's one carbon, and four chlorines. And this guy is actually used in the dry cleaning industry. If it gets in the blood, it's converted to trichloromethyl radical, or CCL3 dot, which is a free radical. And this happens in the P450 system of the liver. Now that it's this free radical, it starts wreaking havoc on the hepatocytes of your liver. It can start damaging proteins, DNA, and cell membranes. In the early stages, though, this damage is actually reversible. And one way you can tell is by looking for cellular swelling. So the cells are actually swelling. And this causes the rough endoplasmic reticulum of the cell to also swell. And remember how on your rough endoplasmic reticulum, you've got all your ribosomes, right? Which help us make proteins. So when it swells, they pop off and your protein synthesis goes down. And what does our liver do again? Oh, right, right. It gathers up fat and cholesterol from the diet and repackages it and sends it back on its way. This repackaging process is done by our good friends, the apolipoproteins. Apolipoproteins. Proteins that help receive, pack, and send back out the fats and the cholesterol. So if carbon tetrachloride, or rather trichloromethyl radical, damages the liver cell and causes swelling and loss of ribosomes, then you'll get this decreased production of proteins and a decrease in our friends, the polypoproteins. Now all of a sudden you've got these fats coming into the liver, but not being repackaged and sent back out. And lo and behold, the fat doesn't escape, and you get this fatty change in the liver. Check out this histology of some hepatocytes. These circular spaces represent the accumulation of fat, or fatty liver. So this fat buildup in the liver is ultimately caused by free radical damage, 